The Old Testament reading for this the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the prophet Isaiah, the fifth chapter. I will sing from the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When the harvest time approached, 
he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned the third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they reply, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. So Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders has rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Here ends the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. A song of the grass and field. A song of the soil and the good green grass. A song no more of the city streets, a song of the soil of the fields. A song with the smell of sun-dried hay, where the nimble pitchers handle the pitchfork. A song tasting of new wheat and of fresh husked maize. For the lands and for these passionate days, and for myself, now I a while return to thee. O soil of autumn fields, reclining on thy breast, giving myself to thee, answering the pulses of thy sane and equable heart, turning a purse for thee. O earth that hast no voice, confide to me a voice. O harvest of my lands, O boundless summer growths, O lavish brown parturient earth, O infinite teeming womb. O theater of time and Day and night, a verse to seek to see, to narrate thee. Dear brothers and sisters, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, these words are those of that greatest American poet, optimist and transcendental humanist, Walt Whitman. Prefatory lines from his 1867 poem, A Carol of Harvest, a delightful ode to agriculture and the harvest season which we are, of course, all now amid, as the cooler temperatures and routine rains clearly admit. Like Whitman and so many others, I've always been particularly fond of autumn and of the harvest season, the denouement of the theater of seasons, as it were, growing up in the Mississippi Delta, home to truly endless rice and cotton fields, perhaps there's some nostalgia involved in my affinity for this time of year. And perhaps it was under the influence of this very nostalgia that Amanda and I, upon arriving here in the Beaver State, decided to plant a tiny garden around the vicarage house. You know, she's more accustomed to cornfields up in Indiana and Ohio than than rice and cotton, but the uh, love for the harvest season is certainly mutual. And so we've tried our hand at growing some things these past few months, although late in the game as it has been. Nothing serious, of course, and nothing near the breakback labor of those Arkansans and Hoosiers around whom we grew up, but we've managed to get a few things going. Indeed, just this past week, we managed to harvest some parsley and rosemary and basil, not too bad for a couple of agriculturally clueless millennials. However, I've never grown any fruit at all, so I haven't the slightest clue what it takes to nurture, say, a vineyard. For I must confess previously, really, my only interest in vineyards was uh, stirred solely by talk of wine tastings. Regardless of my ignorance, 
Though uh, I imagine the work of a vine dresser, a vineyard, is similar enough to working with other crops, surely. And I tell you one thing about which I was sorely reminded this past week when our harvest was somewhat on the modest side, even relatively speaking, was that of the value, the necessity, really, of pruning. Yes, you simply must prune if you want to reap a good harvest, and suffice to say, I did not prune like I should, or at all. Therefore, our harvest was probably less substantial than it might otherwise have been. To be sure, the harvest and the harvest season is plainly all that much better when there's been pruning along the way. Well, dear flock, you know, we hear a lot about uh, vineyards and harvests in our text this morning, namely from the prophet Isaiah and from our own Lord. Actually, in Isaiah, we get a song of the vineyard, a prophet's prophecy in poetry. And while Whitman, the foolhardy optimist, has only faith in the harvest season, Isaiah tells us, tells us of a harvest gone awry, or rather of a vineyard misused and abused. Isaiah, the prophetic poet, pins a song to the one he loves, to his God and Lord, writing that he, the one God Yahweh, had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well, and then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Isaiah later tells us that the vineyard of the Lord Almighty, it is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines in which the Lord delights. Furthermore, though, when, when the Lord looked for justice therein, when he looked for justice, he saw only bloodshed. And when he looked for righteousness, he heard only cries of distress. That is to say, when the Lord looked to his chosen vineyard for the fruits in which he delighted, those vines in which he delighted, he saw only bad fruit. The evidence, perhaps, of persistent poor pruning. For the people chosen by God to be his very own, they rejected his ways. They rejected God again and again, and therefore misused and abused his vineyard themselves. We all know, of course, though, that this is not the end of the story. Throughout Isaiah's oft-poetic prophecy, he points so poignantly to a remnant. Through which a savior would come, a vine through which the vineyard would be restored. And so the story continues. Most explicitly in our Lord's own words this morning, in our gospel text, where our Savior tells us that Jesus, after his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem and after his confrontation in the temple, our Savior directs a number of pointed parables to the scribes and Pharisees to elucidate both their failings as religious authorities, as well as his own authority and his purpose. In our parable today, the parable of the bad tenants, Christ echoes much of that poetic language of the prophet Isaiah. He too speaks of a landowner who planted a vineyard, who put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. As with Isaiah in this parable, the vines of the vineyard are the people of God. And the tenants here, those working the field, so to speak, are the religious authorities, those entrusted to lead the people of God. But in this parable, Jesus says that certain servants were sent by the vineyard's landowner to collect the fruit when the harvest season finally came. Yet these servants met by the tenants were most unfortunately beaten killed and stoned. They were disacknowledged and repudiated. And friends, these servants, these beaten, killed, and stoned servants were the holy prophets. Those holy servants sent by God to direct the people and especially the religious authorities back toward the ways of righteousness. But Israel, God's chosen, the vines in which he delighted, again and again rebuffed them and turned away from them and turned away from God and heeded not their words of warning and correction. And Jesus tells us that 
Upon hearing of this misuse and abuse of his servants, the landowner at last sends his very own son to collect what was wrecked of the harvest. Surely the tenants would respect the landowner's own son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Instead of the reaping of righteousness, the son found only bloodshed among the tenants of the vineyard, his own bloodshed. They rejected the son, that last hope for a fruitful harvest. And friends, after sharing this critical parable with the scribes and Pharisees, our Lord then apprises these religious authorities that the kingdom of God will be taken away from them. And it will be given to another people who will produce its fruit. That is to say, God's first chosen, the Israelites, or at least those Israelites who reject the landowner's own son, those who reject the son of the living God and kill him, will be dispossessed of the vineyard. The land will be taken away and given to another people, indeed to all people, who will produce its fruit. Dear flock, this is exactly what has come to pass. We know the Almighty Father, through the blood shed by His very own Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He has given the vineyard to all men and women. He has opened it up to Jew and Gentile alike and to all who receive the promises won by Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are, of course, that people. That people to whom God has granted the kingdom. Through Christ, we are granted that kingdom. We are given the vineyard. Or rather, through Christ, as his one body, the church, we have become the vineyard. And those in the holy ministry, it's vine dressers. It's vineyards. We are the very vines in which the Lord now delights. And in these last days, these last days since Christ's Death, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. We are all, each of us, amid the beginnings of the harvest season. With salvation won, the vineyard is now ripe. In the theater of seasons, as the divine economy, all the seed has already been sown. Already been sown by Christ's work on that cross. And now, the fruits, those fruits from the teeming womb of his sacrifice, are ready for reaping. Yes, friends, we are the vines in which the Father now delights, but in truth, we are more the one vine. The one vine, Jesus Christ, as we, as the church, are his one body. You and I, therefore, are individually more like proper branches of that one vine, members of his one body. And as our Lord tells us in the Gospel of John, He is the true vine, and his father is the gardener, so his father, he cuts off every branch in his son that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will become even more fruitful. Yes, he prunes us, friends, for the harvest all must be pruned. To each of us, Though we remain in Christ, the one true vine, through which all the fruit of the branches is born, but for each of us, we we too bear individual fruits. And so that we become more fruitful, we must be pruned. Consequently, in knowing the necessity of pruning for a bountiful harvest, in what then, beloved, does this pruning consist? How does our Lord, the vine dresser, prune us? as those branches of his one vine, Christ. Well, it is through this. It is through the daily remembrance of our baptism. And I know I speak of this so often, but it's just so very crucial. He prunes us through the daily drowning of that old Adam within us, that old sinful self, by the drowning of that sinful self in our baptismal being, which occurs in its very remembrance. And moreover, he prunes us through the sorrow of that daily drowning and conviction of our sins and repentance for them. And make no mistake that that 
conviction and sorrow comes only from hearing the word of God. His precious word, which always shows us our utter failure before his law. Yes, he prunes us through the word and through the constant drowning of sin and baptismal floods. He prunes us through these with the dead, dying, and diseased shoots and buds of sin and evil lust cut off, cut away from us, toward room, toward making room for that new growth, which is sanctification by the Holy Ghost. And that pruning, dear faithful, it is most clearly evident in confession and absolution. When we sorrowfully bring our sins before pastor and before God, and receive the assurance of Christ's forgiveness. By his word, by his holy baptism, uh, and by absolution, we are pruned that as Christ says in the Gospel of John, we may become even more fruitful. Yet as branches of the true vine, we are not only pruned by his word and sacraments, we are fed by it. Indeed, we are fed by Christ's own body and blood in the most blessed sacrament of the altar. His body, the body of the Son of the living God, is our, our summer sun, our late summer sun, and his, his blood are much needed rains. His body and blood strengthen us for the growing season and into the harvest, toward that ultimate harvest, through all the sanctification that occurs in our life, toward that ultimate harvest at the end of our days. His Eucharist sustains us for the long haul through every dry and difficult season. And brothers and sisters, you've all confessed your sinfulness this morning. You've received Christ's forgiveness. You have heard the word of God, his law and his gospel, and your baptism is ever before you. Which is to say you have been pruned. Therefore, come now. Receive Christ's own body and blood. Be fed by the sun and the rains. Be even more fruitful. Be that people which bear the fruits of the vineyard. That people in which the, the Father now delights. Be the many branches of the one true vine as his church. And as such, always welcome the harvest. You know, I suggested earlier that Whitman was foolhardy in his optimism. But perhaps I misspoke. To be certain, we are always right to be hopeful for the coming of the harvest season. The crisp, cool air, the coloring of the leaves, in my mind, endless white cotton fields. And for us all, the harvest, the vineyard, ripe and ready. But our hope, our harvest hope, is only ever in that which has already been sown. And for us, as the church, that which has already been sown is the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension into heaven of the Word made flesh, and the promises won thereby for all men. And that hope, that hope in those promises, that hope is truly the stuff of poetry, of a prophet's song, or even a poet's ode to the turning of the seasons of God's creation. That hope which alone can rightly inspire a song of the soil of the autumn fields. That hope which is wholly and wholly inspired. Thus let that always be your hope, dear flock. Let that be your song and ode and inspiration this harvest season and every harvest season. Yes, I, I positively love this time of year. I love autumn and the harvest season. What a joy it is to be in these times. And what a joy it is to be in these last days. Having the promises of Christ as our hope and our song and our autumnal confidence. And so my brothers and sisters in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, with these words, words of poetic hope in the harvest of Christ's own, Shared between a pruned sinner and other pruned sinners. Toward sanctification through the turning of the seasons this side of glory. May you now, by the grace of God, by the presence of Christ in both word and sacrament, that word and sacrament which prune and feed us year by year, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, 
who, who works the sowing of faith within us in what, what Christ's work has already sown. Bringing us here, gathering us together before pulpit and altar. By the power of these three, may you be forever kept in the eternal security of our Lord's heavenly bosom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.